Hello, and uh, this is number 112 in the Infinite series of Mark talking about his things. Today is Sunday, 27th of June, 2021. Um, I have decided that I'm going to be talking about one of my favourite bands, um, and it's not my favourite album of theirs. It's really, really difficult to pick a favourite album by The Cure. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about 1989's Cure album, Disintegration. What you may already have noticed is that I... I t you might think I'm talking a lot about a lot of old bands and, and kind of talk about some band that formed before, you know, 1812. Um, yeah, I go chronologically through these. I talk through every record that the band makes and I talk about most of the bands that I love. Uh, and what that means is that a lot of the early episodes have been me talking about records that I don't remember happening because for either for some reason I, I was either too young or I wasn't born or the band formed before I was born, and uh, everything I know about it I've read from books. This is the first Cure album that I experienced in real time, show by show, release by release, in order at the time. Because when this album came out, uh, I can't remember the date, May, maybe April 1989, I was 15 years old. Um, and when you're 15 years old, everything seems very, very important. In fact, of course, when you're my age now, considerably older than 15 everything is still really really important uh but i have to kind of put in the context of what the world was like at that point is that you found out about band's tour dates by either a weekly uh advert in the melody maker or the enemy or a handwritten sign that was outside the ticket agency in town or a news article in the the evening mail and you know if you had a network of friends just trust me, I did have friends at the time, by the way. Uh, when you have a network of friends, they would ring each other up and go, did you know that Band X are playing at the NEC? And then it's like, right, OK. Guess I'm going to have to buy tickets. You know, and then there'd be people that would be queuing in person outside ticket offices, sometimes all night long. I, I did do that once um, and never again, I'm afraid to say. Um but also, you know, it had to rely on having physical cash available, having the cash point that was nearest the, the venue, having money, uh, things like card transactions, internet bookings, even telephone bookings were pretty difficult, actually. So it was a very, very different world. You'd only hear about songs if they were in an interview or a review. Um, you'd only hear the songs that were released, or if you were into the bootleg tape trading community, um, songs that had made their way out. You couldn't just upload a recording of a show and put it on YouTube. Nobody had even invented the internet at that point. So, for example, in 1995, um, I was a Morrissey fan then, and Morrissey started playing Smith songs in his live show, and there were rumours that he had played Shoplifters of the World Unite in, um, I think, Falkirk. And everyone was like, he's playing Smith songs? Hmm, you know, he hadn't played Smith songs for a decade. And the idea of seeing a member of the Smiths playing Smith songs was, seemed... Bizarre, that band was dead and gone, but the rumour kind of spread through, but it was only when, you know, you saw it happen with your own eyes that actually it was true and it was real. Very, very different world. Uh, bands used to send out promotional postcards uh, to you if they, if you filled in a form that was in one of their records saying, if you want more information about The Cure, join The Cure's fan club at PO Box, you know, 187 in Hertfordshire or somewhere. You know, and the idea was that that band would somehow live in Hertfordshire and, and there'd be a P.O. box and somehow one of the band would go there or and it also seemed very very strange these days when you've got the days of instant access and communication to the band itself of course with with Disintegration which is The Cure's eighth album um, it was all it was still that world very very analogue very real uh, very strange world actually is that a band could disappear and not play for a year and you would have no idea of what's going on um you know, if somebody left the group, you might hear about it three months later. You certainly wouldn't get a Twitter statement six minutes after it with a pre-prepared video of them saying, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, and, uh, you know, thanking everybody from the NHS and then resigning or still going away with a tasty pay paycheck. None of that was happening. It was all real. And so Disintegration is the last album that Lol Tolhurst is, is uh, credited as a member of the group. Um, and I have to kind of address what happened there. Um, obviously, other people have got a story to tell around that, including the people that were in the room. I can only go upon what I've read and what I've heard, which is that 
at the end of the kissing tour in 1987 uh lol was a functional alcoholic um he was the band's keyboard player but he wasn't he hadn't become the band's primary keyboard player roger o'donnell had joined on keyboards so the band had two keyboard players lol who had um, migrated from playing the drums to playing keyboards uh, and what we had was a six-piece configuration of the group as seen in the videos for uh, just like heaven and hot 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 um, and the tail end of the, the kissing tour but uh, lol's contribution to the group at this point was was quite small um, I think Lol had written a song which turned into Homesick that uh, Roger, Simon and Boris had taken into a rehearsal studio and they'd, they'd played and jammed around with and so they'd got a much, much better, stronger arrangement of the song which then became Homesick. Uh, but, that, but I don't think any of his keyboard parts appear on the album according to what Roger has written on his website with a, a, a section called Disintegration Memories is that Roger re-recorded many of Lowell's parts and so Roger may not uh, Roger may play all the keyboards on the record and Lowell may not be audible at all of course if you want to hear Lowell's sides of it please do buy this book it's a fascinating read I have advocated uh, reading it before but uh, effectively I think December 1988 when the recording or maybe the, uh, of the album had come to pretty much a close now, not December 1988, but, but around about that time, uh, Lowell heard the finished version of the album in Rack Studios in London. Um, and halfway during the playback, and I quote, he said, half is good and half is shit. I mean, some songs sound like The Cure, but some don't. And I fell back into my seat with a thump. Um, Lowell says he thinks he felt so bad that he hadn't been able to put it together enough to contribute to the album and he'd lashed out against it. But unfortunately... If you're going to not contribute to a record in a substantial way, if you're only going to bring one song that the band then use and form into it, if you are effectively an alcoholic, and, um, you know, it's a very tough position for Lol to be in, actually, is to feel sidelined in the group which you formed with your childhood friend, and for then to everyone to focus on on the other person in the partnership. Um, it's, it's very difficult, actually, from an ego perspective, to realise that you've effectively both been made and sort of made yourself redundant from the group. Um, so there was a handwritten letter which Robert had sent to uh, Lowell, which effectively said, everybody in the band says, if you come on the next tour, they won't be coming, so you should not come on the tour that I am planning. Do not try and change my mind, as this decision is not changeable. Um... Yeah, I've got a lot of sympathy for Lol. Um, I've heard him talk. He, he seems a very nice, astute and humble man these days. But when you're an alcoholic, everything looks very, very foggy. Everything uh, is distorted by the shape of the bottom of a glass. You make bad decisions and they don't feel like bad decisions because you don't feel the badness of it. Because if you're an alcoholic, effectively, you know, you're. it's really hard. It's really difficult. And sometimes you don't know what the bottom is until you reach there. Um, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to him. I think from a group perspective, Robert and the group made the right decision. It was not going to be possible for the band to tour with Lol as a member, especially if he didn't like the album. Even though he was very clear in saying to the rest of the band that half of the album is good and half of it is shit, he was prepared to tour and be a member of the group. I think leaving the group was what needed to happen in order for him to recover and realised he'd re reach rock bottom. There was a court case which went on, which is in 1994, which when I talk about the, the Wish album, uh, the, the aftermath of that, and the Wild Mood Swings album, I think I might get into that a little bit. Uh, but it was a really, really difficult period, I think, for, for Lol, and actually for the, for the group as a whole, because effectively you've, you've got to go from the perception that The Cure is actually a band to the realisation that the one person that had been in the band alongside Robert throughout the whole period of time was no longer in the group, didn't do the group any favours whatsoever if there was trying to challenge a conception that The Cure was anything other than Robert's, although clearly it very much was so. So, for example, the cover art for Disintegration there only has one member of the band featured. And uh, Andy Feller and Pearl, then Paul, were putting together a number of, of proposed artworks for the cover of the album. Um, and I think they put, they mocked up this one 
uh, with the idea that it wouldn't be the one that would be chosen because they preferred some other designs. If you've seen some alternate designs of some, some albums, such as Pink Floyd's Animals, for example, you can see why the band chose the one which they did go with. In the end, the decision was taken to go with this, and so Robert's the only member of the group on the cover of Disintegration. Um, and it doesn't help the perception that The Cure is anything other than Robert's. Although, if you look at the demos from the album, which are on the uh, 2000 and whatever the year is uh, reissue of it. Where's my copy of Disintegration gone? Oh, hang on, it's behind here. So, my copy of Disintegration, if you look at the demos, they're on this 3CD edition that was released in 2010. Um, a number of the demos are by Robert. In fact, uh, I think the ones by Robert are R7, which is pictures of you, R MY, which is Disintegration, R12, which effectively became Homesick, which was originally called The Tale of the Lonely Badge, uh, Lullaby, Fascination Street, Last Dance. Those were all Robert songs, as well as uh, home demos on this of Prayers for Rain, uh, Fascination Street. Um, there were also demos written by other members of the group. So Simon wrote Love Song, The Same Deep Water as You, and... Oh, where is it now? Untitled. Uh, Roger wrote Out of Mind and Fear of Ghosts, which he had called The Other Side, and Boris called The Fog. And uh, Paul wrote a song which turned out on on this reissue, which is called Delirious Night. Um, the, the, if you're going to buy one version of the album, do get the three-disc version, because it, not only does it have all the, the, uh, the band demos on and studio mixes and rough mixes it's got 20 bonus tracks on it's also got a revised and expanded version of the live album from the tour so the first single from the album it depends which country you're in as to what the first single from the album was if you were in the uk the first single was lullaby if you're in the us the first single was fascination street which i think is named after a street in new orleans um, the american record label made the decision that they thought that Fascination Street was uh, a better choice for the first single. And Fascination Street is a great classic Cure track that the band play live to this day. Um, it's a great single. It was never released as a single in the UK. I think the video was shot at a power station in South London. might be Battersea Power Station, actually, which is one of my favourite buildings in the world. Um, and the B-side of it was a track called Babble. Now, in the UK, it was Lullaby. So, if you're in Def Leppard, I wasn't expecting to mention this, if you're in Def Leppard, by the way, the first single from Hysteria was, was Women, and I think in the UK, I think it might have been Armageddon, it, actually, um, but whichever single it was, all the B-sides got bumped up, so that the B-side on the American version um, was always one song behind, because there was one extra single in the US. So in the UK, there were three singles from the album, uh, and in the US, I think there were four. So... Um, Fascination Street is the first single from the album in America. Absolutely fantastic song. Cannot recommend it enough. And I think if you look carefully, it's a kind of like a, a close-up stroke zoom in of some of the disintegration cover sleeve art there. Lullaby, meanwhile, has a slightly different cover. Um, this is that famous song about the Spider-Man on candy striped legs. Now, putting it technically, Lullaby was formatted to fuck. I don't like to swear, but it was very, very formatted. There was gatefolds, there was pink vinyls, there was limited editions, there was a three-inch CD single, which, by the way, I've got up there, which I need to get for you. Um, and it, it, there was a limit on the chart rules about the number of different formats that you could release a single in. So if you could release, I think, uh, I think you could release a maximum of 12 formats. And The Cure, like Depeche Mode, uh, like some of the other bands, The Mission, for example, knew that the fans would buy multiple formats of a release and so that they would generate multiple formats because why sell it one time if you can sell it 12 times and then it gets higher into the charts. So Lullaby, I think, went into the charts at 12 um, and that, that was you know in and gone, pretty much. But if you were able to release a second set of formats the week later, it kept the song up and sold the same amount of copies. Um, Depeche Mode did this when they did three different 12 inches, three CDs, a 7-inch, uh, and a cassette for Enjoy the Silence, for example, and, uh, or two, two different 7-inches and two different CDs and two different 12 inches for Personal Jesus, all of which were released a week apart. Um, but uh, Lullaby is... The first single from the album, the one that's played at near enough every show that the band ever play. I think I, I've seen them. I think I've seen them not play it twice. I think 
out of the quite a lot of times I've seen The Cure. And uh, it's uh, an excellent, excellent song. Um, it's also perhaps the strangest song about being eaten alive by Spider-Man. Um, there's, a, there's a theory that Lullaby is a song about uh, child abuse and about the idea that, you know, on Candy Stripe Legs, the Spider-Man comes softly from the shadows of the evening sun and the, the one about it feels like I'm being eaten by a thousand shivering furry holes. Um, the idea being is that that's a child describing being abused by, a, by an adult. It's a terrifying thing. It really is. And then the imagery around that is actually around a giant spider. Um, when the band, if you've got a fear of spiders, by the way, going to see the cure is probably not the best thing to do. Now, I wish that the internet had a, like a plug-in which would just automatically replace pictures of spiders with like you know cuddly teddy bears. But that's not what you can't do that in real life. So when the cure play lullaby and there's video of a huge spider on a spider's web, I just kind of look at the band instead of look at the video because the video is kind of scary. I don't like things with lots and lots of legs. Um, they don't look like creatures but again if you look at the cover for for, for lullaby it it really is uh kind of like a, a blurry shot of what looks like possibly a tarantula and the the single also came out on hang on a moment i'm gonna go and get my pile of uh three inch cds it came out on a three inch cd short-lived format here it is inside a gatefold sleeve uh, that has both the seven inch mix of lullaby a track called babylon and a track called uh, uh, out of mind which is a, a roger demo and a three inch cd they're absolutely tiny um in a gatefold sleeve and i presume that the gatefold on the seven inch is uh, possibly a picture like this but it might be a different picture indeed um now out of mind and babble a great song so i bought this seven inch i remember very clearly i bought the the, the seven inch from a news agents in Sturchley, I think next to Sturchley Swimming Pool uh, in, in Birmingham, England, uh, when it had fallen out of the charts. And I listened to the B-side, and the B-side was Babylon. I'm like, and if that's just the B-side, this band have got to be excellent. Well, if you've made it this far into the video, you know the band are excellent. There was also a 12-inch of Lullaby. Just one 12-inch. There it is. It's got the 12-inch mix of Lullaby on, which has been the called the extended remix remixed by uh dave allen i think and produced by um pappy saunders whoever that is i'm sure i should know the answer to that of course the 12 inch is a fantastic remix and sometimes the band play the 12 inch version of the song live instead if you're in the u.s meanwhile you've got fascination street here's the cd i haven't got the 12 inch uh, which has the 7-inch remix, Babble and Out of Mind, and then an extended remix of Fascination Street. And the extended remix of Fascination Street wasn't officially issued in Britain until a year later when the mixed-up remix compilation album came out. So the only place you could get it for a long time was on the Fascination Street CD or 12-inch, or a box set called Integration, which had the, the multiple CD singles from it. I don't have Integration because I bought all the CDs separately. Um, there was also a promotional postcard. Here it is. Uh, lullaby featuring the picture, which I think is on the gatefold of the 7-inch. There's a promotional postcard for the album. And here's one for the prayer tour as well. And as you can see, very clearly focusing on, on Robert as the sole member of the group. You look at that as well. What you see is that they, they play Glasgow, Birmingham and Wembley. So the idea of a tour is you play two shows in a country. A very common theme at that point. And uh, the band added extra shows at the Birmingham NEC. Um, and they added an extra show the third night, I think, at the Wembley Arena on, I think, the 24th of July, 1989. It doesn't seem like it's that long ago when the band did the tour. So, Disintegration. I haven't talked about the album. I'm going to have to. And because I've, I've, I've shown you this three times already in, in previous editions of Mark Talks About His Stuff, I'm going to talk about the Disintegration. Here is the picture disc version of Disintegration. Now, Disintegration has two running orders and two different configurations, depending upon which format you originally bought it in. There was the CD, which had 12 tracks on it, and there was the LP, which had 10 tracks on it, and the cassette also had 12 tracks on it. So, of course, I bought the cassette because I didn't have a CD player at the time. 
Now this, because it's a vinyl disc and it's very tightly packed, so it's about an hour long, this one, it says, this music has been mixed to be played loud, so turn it up. A standard Cure instruction on every Cure record that you buy these days is that it has been mixed to be played loud, so turn it up. Bring the noise. Um, and here's the, the, the March 1990-ish picture disc version of Disintegration, uh, which I bought because I really, really wanted it on vinyl, uh, which of course is a major flex these days. Um, Disintegration has been reissued on picture disc. If it is, it will inevitably be the two disc version of it for Record Store Day, which I'll inevitably buy because it has two extra songs on it. So the 10 track version of it uh, is missing two songs. The songs are Last Dance on side one and Homesick on side two. And it's a fantastic album. You know this, I know this, everybody knows this. This is the album that when people talk about the, the Cure's best period, they talk about Disintegration being the best period of the band. It's a brilliant album for a number of reasons. The first one is I think it's the, the most cohesive, fully formed album that the band have made. Other albums, such as Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Wish, Wild Boom Swings, um, they vary in, in their content in so much as they go through a number of different styles, a number of different approaches they go from ultra poppy to dark glim suicidal this one is is dark grim and and just generally miserable as hell all the way through uh, very very similar actually to faith uh, maybe similar in some respects to 17 seconds but perhaps better than both of those and um, because for the first time with roger the band had a dedicated keyboard player as opposed to a keyboard player that also played a an other instrument um, so for example um, pearl played guitar and then picked up keyboards and because he had to. Um, Lol was a drummer who then picked up keyboards whereas Roger was a keyboard player all the way through. And also I think probably more musically adept than, than uh, Lol at keyboards. So much so that during the recording of one of the songs, Prayers for Rain for example, Roger played a keyboard uh, piano solo all the way through it uh, and, and Robert was like well that's great but it's too musical so that they actually turned the tape upside down played it backwards and then Roger played a different solo and then they flipped that solo and stuck it back onto the original so the keyboard solo that you hear on, on, on uh, Prayers for Rain is actually a backwards played part that's then played forwards I don't know how they did it um, when I reverse stuff on, on my, my, my software, it's always got this weird and unusual sense of attack against it because the note fades up very quickly as opposed to fades out once it's been struck. Um, but there you are. So there's, there's 10 songs on this, and I'm going to talk through each one of the songs. The first one is Plain Song, which opens a lot of Cure shows. Um, there is normally, a when the band play live, there's a two-minute slowly increasing in volume set of chimes, which then opens into a... a a very fairly memorable four note um, keyboard part. That keyboard part is reprised at a different speed uh, in Untitled, which is the last song. So the album opens and closes on the same connecting motif. And that song opens with the lines, I think it's dark and it looks like rain again and the wind is blowing like it's the end of the world. It's a wonderful song. It took me some time before I, I it took me several years of seeing the band before I saw them play playing song live um, but good things come to those who wait it's a fantastic track um, and the second song on the album is pictures of you which is available in three different four different mixes actually the, the album version is about seven and a half minute epic take upon the track um, that, that, that really kind of explores the whole thing so and at, at the time when I bought this album um, I hadn't got any experience of adult relationships I hadn't got a an understanding of what it was like to be in love or anything like that it was quite a i had an, an abstract understanding that i'd learned from films of what love and sex and relationships might be like and so the idea of i've been looking so long at these pictures of you i can hardly believe that they're real you know that that really kind of resonated with me because the only experience i had of of of, of love was something that existed only in my mind nobody else you know, girls didn't even know I existed at that point. And of course, there is a girl in every story. And I, there was a girl that I really, really liked, that really, really, I, that really liked The Cure. Um, and I borrowed some tapes off her. 
um, and I made excuses to borrow tapes to record them and then to go around this here and sit and, and drink tea and think, well, this is kind of like a relationship, but it isn't because I didn't really know what a relationship was. You know, but the idea of just sitting down and talking with, with someone that I really liked was, was seemed pretty amazing, actually. Wow. Uh, you know, another human is talking to me and finding me tolerable. Um, I wasn't... I didn't even think of myself of being friend-zoned because the word didn't exist then and the concept of friend-zoning is absolute bullshit. The idea that somehow women owe you sex or a relationship because you're nice to them and that if you, you know, you complain about being friend-zoned, well, frankly, mate, that's why you've been friend-zoned, isn't it? Because you, you think that, that women should be in a relationship with you because you've been nice to them. They don't owe you pretty. They don't owe you anything, you know, and you, and, and there's no obligation around that. So as far as I was concerned, it's just a girl that I quite liked and I got on quite well with, but I didn't have a relationship with and she liked the cure. And yeah, that was pretty good. You know, obviously, my my um, my romantic adventures uh, took a little while longer before they started. Um, now, Pictures of You, great song. They still play it live. It still hits me right in the gut every time they play it. I'm still like, oh my God, I mean, how can music do this? And there's a huge sense of community for me when I listen to Disintegration, because what I hear when I when I listen to Disintegration is, is I, I, I kind of hear um, like a sense of, of, of belonging, because I, I kind of felt, you know, growing up, especially before the internet, it was very difficult to be able to to think of, are the, the emotions or the feelings that I'm feeling unique to me, or are they emotions that are common? And does everybody feel like this? And it's really difficult, especially if you're in like a... a you know, a pub environment to stop and go, is it, is it just me? Or, or, you know, you don't get that moment of meta text conversation, or at least you certainly didn't when you were, when I was 15, 16, 17, you know, I didn't get the opportunity to go, is it just me or is it everybody that feels like this? You know, is it just me that thinks Margaret Thatcher was a terrible prime minister or does, did everybody feel like that? You know, and, and the sense, there was a sense of, um, you know, community and solidarity um, and comfort in this album because the emotions that I felt and I really really struggled with my emotions when I was 15 or 16 because I didn't know what was right what what, what I should be feeling should I be feeling the things that other people are feeling do, do I even feel what I think I feel and how much of it is imaginary for example you know all of those things were moments where this album kind of reached out to me Although obviously it didn't intend to, and it had no idea it was doing so. But this album was a friend that didn't know that I existed. And it kind of said to me, look, it's not just you, okay, that, that you feel certain things. And those are very common human emotions. Um, so, for example, Close Down, which follows pictures of you. I, I've long struggled with hope. To quote John Cleese in Clockwise, it's not the despair. It's the despair I can stand. It's the hope, the hope that really gets me. Um, and, you know, this album was, was almost, it's almost like Prozac for me, in so much as when I listen to it, I immediately feel better. Firstly, because there's no way I could feel as miserable as Robert Smith did during this album. Uh, but secondly, the sense of that I, my experiences are not totally unique. I'm not the wrong, one wonky ingredient in this, you know, um, that other people felt like the way that I felt. And it's important to know that. Um, obviously, with the rise of the internet, it's very, it's much easier to find a community of people that think the way that you do. So, for example, when The Cure uh, were touring in 1996 and they did World Mood Swings, most of my friends who liked The Cure in 1989 didn't like The Cure anymore. So, of the 15 or so of us that that wanted to see The Cure on the prayer tour, you know, I think it was myself and James that went to the the NEC show. So that was like 15 to, to down to two. But then, yeah, the other the other people uh, who I don't really tend to see very much of these days because I live a very long way away, away from them, and my life has changed beyond all recognition, and I'm a much better, happier person. Um, they were all kind of like, don't really like them. I like Oasis now, and of course, uh, in about a month or so's time, I'm going to talk about the 25th anniversary of Oasis playing Nebworth, and I think I'm going to hold on some of those thoughts until then. But to me, the cure is 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 like you know, dog for Christmas. It's not just for Christmas. The cure is for life, uh, and I, I'm definitely going to be you know the oldest miserable adolescent. In the retirement home when i get to that point still banging on about how i saw the cure in the 90s and they were phenomenal um 
Okay, so I should be talking about more songs on this album and less about myself because I've only made it to the first half of Close Down and I'm half, away, half an hour through this. Um, the third song on the LP is Close Down and that's on, on all the versions of it as well. Uh, and it's, it's a great song which I haven't seen the band play live actually um, since the band played their 30th anniversary of disintegration shows only in Sydney Opera House on the other side of the goddamn world um, I haven't seen The Cure play Closed Down um, I, it's one of the, it, the, that alongside The Same Deep Water As You is the song they played the most that I haven't seen actually um, which is frustrating the other thing about the album is there's two songs missing uh, so the next song after Close Down is, I think, I think it's Love Song. Now, Love Song is is not a song that the band were particularly enamoured with when they were recording it. They weren't sure whether it was going to be a hit, whether anybody would like it. It kind of taps into the same kind of sense of, 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 of straightforward pop that you might get from the, from, from the Brillo building uh, group. Um, it's, it's a brilliant song, but it's not representative or typical of the album. By the way, the video of Love Song opens with a stalactite, or is it a stalagmite? I can never remember. It very, very clearly looks like a piece of male genitalia, and I'm sure that is intentional for a reason. Um, Love Song is a song that some people really don't like, uh, and and some people really do like, um, and, and the most important thing is that it's a cure song, and you can't have light without shade, and you can't have shade without light. It's... It's for me, it's a little bit of a palate cleanser. It's kind of like that glass of water that you take in when you're drinking, when you're having a really, really hot Indian meal. It just cleans it and you go start again. So the next song after that is on the LP, it's Lullaby, which I've already discussed. And on the CD and cassette versions, it's The Last Dance, which I finally got to see in 2019 uh, when I saw them play Malahide in, in Dublin. And I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad that you remembered. Now, Last Dance is... is unfairly not on the album this out of all the cure albums that should have been released as a double album if there's one it's this it really is uh, last dance did however get a second life its first appearance on vinyl was on the seven inch single of pictures of you by the way uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful song about you know memories and, and loss and, and all the things that go with it you know the idea of the woman now standing where but once there was only a girl looking at uh, and, and reflecting upon pictures of somebody that you knew when they were a teenager had then become a woman or you know if you're an adolescent as i was when this came out matching that journey from becoming a child to becoming an adult and to then to go that person that child is still there but they've become more of themselves and then the last song uh, after the song after lullaby is Fascination Street, which is brilliant. They should play it at every show. It's got this wonderful pounding bass line that launched a thousand careers. Um, and, and it's just one of the one of the best Cure songs that there is. Flipping it over, side two, or fast forwarding and then turning the cassette over to Prayers for Rain, uh, which is one of the songs I've seen them play a lot. Um, and it's a great song. In fact, the long I, when I saw the last show on the Wild Mood Swings tour, I counted the seconds when Robert did that huge vocal right at the end of the song, and I counted 37 seconds. And I thought, well, either he's using an echo or he can really belt it out. I don't really know, but it's a fantastic song which builds and builds and builds on a whole bunch of, of um, kind of intertwining guitar parts, keyboard parts, and this kind of pounding drum roll that just keeps going all the way through. And the one thing I will say about the album is the drumming on this is fantastic. Um, and uh, I know the drummer from a Cure Tribute Band will agree with me, um, although it might obviously also be really, really hard, because um, Prayers for Rain is this big pounding thing that almost it, it just it kind of wears itself out. Um, so song two, side two, is the same deep water as you. And the same deep water as you is the song that The Cure have played the most that I haven't seen, but also it's a song that launched a thousand genres. Now that doesn't sound like it makes any sense, but the same deep water as you is nine minutes, 53 seconds long, which aside from live recordings of Faith and a Forest, is I think the longest studio recording that's been issued by The Cure, not including a remix. Um, and it's a very... Uh, minimal, very slow, almost kind of maudlin 
mogadon paste kind of thing where it just goes through and it has like three or four parts and it just repeats them with ever so slight variations as it goes through each one of those particular parts and the lyrics are kind of repetitive and echoing of the other parts of it and there's not really a chorus as such but there's that bit where the whole song kind of drops out and uh, Robert sings and I will kiss you and I will kiss you and I'll kiss you forever and, 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 and it's just this huge dense sad thing really if you want to see where, where the genres of post rock started um, listen to this album it's all in there it's just, this is the most song based version of it you know the way in which textures were drawn out and repeated through repetition through gentle changes in each time they went through a verse um, aside from the, the classic kind of like quiet loud quiet loud approach which a lot of post rock bands take you know the idea of a single almost undulating sense of, of, of chords that slowly rotate through a series of permutations uh, came from this album and from the same deep water as you it has launched a thousand bands this album is as influential as the entire career of the velvet underground um, whether that's a good or a bad thing i'll leave you to decide um, and then there's a you know the next song after the same deep water view is the title ta track disintegration um, that the band ha played on every night of the disintegration tour they then rested it and brought it back in 1993 for what turned out to be boris's last show and has been played fairly regularly since then with varying degrees of success um, again Disintegration, like the same deep water as you, is a song that actually follows a very, very almost deliberately kind of crushed set of, of, of palettes, so like a very repetitive bass line, drum parts, guitar parts, keyboard parts, all slightly varying with them. And the only thing actually that, that changes throughout huge chunks of the song is the vocal that, that kind of sits around and that the song itself is a bedrock. It's a classic um, and it's just grim and, and I was just listening to it and I was kind of going my god being an adult don't sound that much fun now that sounds flippant but the bit where he sings about you know I, I leave you with babies and everything and hoping for frequency and screams of sincerity and all that stuff and I'm kind of like I'm just like wow responsibility man that's a really really tough thing isn't it now obviously in his personal life uh, Robert has been in the same relationship for probably 40, 45 years, which is a fantastic achievement. Um, but what that doesn't mean is that, you know, every day, week, month is particularly or always Im immensely easy. Um, and, and what it also means is that people change and you have to change in the same ways and, and change together as you go through time. Um, it also means that actually, you know, in the context of creativity is that you have to be, you know, both very aware of, I think, how lucky you are, if you are in that, but also how other people's struggles, how difficult other people's struggles are, in the same way that David Gedge from The Wedding Present has written a lot about relationships, whilst it's been in the context of a, a generally, you know, secure and good relationship for a very long period of time. Um, with Robert Smith, it's almost observing how other people have found struggles with relationships, uh, and then kind of showing some empathy for that. Um, penultimate song on the album homesick the song that was built upon the initial kind of demo that lol brought to the group and lol's only uh, contribution in terms of writing to this album uh, although he didn't play anything audibly that that anyone has ever ever said um homesick is a again it's almost like a little pause in, in an action movie kind of like love songs that little moment where you kind of realize what you come through and there's the bit where you start to gather your thoughts there's always a moment in in any kind of huge bit of drama where if it's done well there's the moment where you stop and you look back for a second and i don't know you see a tank full of nazis jumping off the cliff or whatever it's going to be uh, and then the last song on the album is untitled i don't think any band should ever release a, a song called untitled um, but that's just my opinion um, but that song, Untitled, is built upon the same four-note keyboard motif that opens up playing song, but it's played faster, and the backing is completely different. So, the, you know, the album starts and ends in the same place, and it changes itself completely as it goes along. This is a goddamn masterpiece. Just buy it, or listen to it on Spotify, or something, uh, uh, because you, you should. And if you're 40 minutes into this, and you haven't made the decision to go and listen to it, or buy it, why? And also, if you don't like this album, do to we friends. I mean, maybe, I don't know. So the um, 
The period following the album uh, was the Prayer Tour, which also came with a number of single releases. This was the second single from the album in the UK, and I think the third in the US, although it might not have been released in the US, it's Love Song. Uh, this was formatted to bits. I did, I did also have a white label that I bought from HQ Records for one whole pound. I later sold it on eBay when I desperately needed the money. I wish I hadn't done it, but I did. Um, and the, the cover of Love Song there, obviously, it's... it's uh, Shameless homage to Queen's The Miracle. Well, it isn't, but actually it's, you know, two faces sharing three eyes, kind of indicating that there's a, a common kind of view through it. Uh, again, a lovely piece of, of work by, by uh, Pearl and Andy, backed with a, an extended remix of Love Song, uh, two tracks which aren't on the album, Too Late and Fear of Ghosts. Too Late is, is a lovely song, which the band first started playing live in 2014 when they did the Teenage Cancer Trust shows at the Royal Albert Hall. In fact, that might be the only times they played it. But I, when, when we saw them play it live, again with James, who has been at most of my Cure gigs over the years, I just couldn't believe that it wasn't a single. It, Too Late sounds like an album track, or it sounds like a single. It, it's an incredible song. It's very bloody happy, but that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, naturally, here's the 12-inch. Of love song again with a slightly different cover um there's got a photograph of the back and what's stitched on the front is, the, is a fabric design backed with too late and fear of ghosts and fear of ghosts as i've mentioned before was written largely by roger under the name the outside also called uh, the fog by boris and um is is a great song which i think they only played live or started playing live in sydney um, now I've got some tapes I need to show you as well uh, from the prayer tour. Here's uh, the Birmingham NEC show from 1989, the first night. This is the second night. Uh, this is um, a bizarre release on treat. This is uh, the original promotional cassette. Uh, if you bought two albums from the Cure's back catalogue in March 1990 from FNAC in France and then later HMV, you got a free Cure cassette for a previously unreleased live album. This is uh, on treat. It was only available on CD and cassette. I should have said to my brother, please get the CD. You got the tape. So that's on treat on tape. Um, and on treat, all the B-sides are taken from uh, this single, Pictures of You, uh, which is remixed and released as two 7-inch singles, one backed with Prayers for Rain that came on green and purple. Here, by the way, is the green vinyl version of it, which is, by the way, incredibly rare now. It sells for a lot of money on, on, on Discogs. And there was a purple 7-inch as well, and they had different B-sides on. Um, so the B-side on this was the first appearance of Last Dance, and then it was Prayers for Rain on here. There were two 12-inches of Pictures of You. Uh, here's an extended remix on the first one, which is backed with Last Dance and the live version of Fascination Street. Uh, this is the black vinyl 12 inch. It also came out on a coloured vinyl 12 inch. Um, and then a week later, as mentioned before, another remix of Pictures of You. This is the, the less amazing reggae version of the song. Uh, back to Prayers for Rain and Disintegration. The extended mix of Pictures of You, which was first on the 12 inch, has to date, I think, only appeared on the three CD version of Mixed Up, but I could be wrong. Pictures of You got a CD single release in the UK with Last Dance and Fascination Street. Uh, and if you wanted to get the other B sides, Prayers for Rain and Disintegration, you had to buy the five inch CD from America, which had Prayers for Rain and Disintegration on. Um, there was also, of course, a commercial release of On Treat which came out in uh, early 1991 after lots of, after I think Robert heard that lots of people were paying an enormous amount of money for the promotional CD and cassette of On Treat and it got a release on, I think, vinyl CD and cassette as a mid price album with the, um, I think, eight songs live from Wembley on and it had a slightly different cover as a result. But it was a way of, of targeting the problem with um, expensive second hand releases. Entree finally also got uh, a release on vinyl in a full expanded version. This is Entree Plus, which is the 12 songs from Disintegration played live at Wembley Arena in 1989, uh, which is also the third CD on the Disintegration reissue, wherever I've stuck that, whatever shelf that is on. Um, so if you want to get Entree live on vinyl, the double 
LP version of it in there. Now, I was wondering whether I'd have enough time to talk through the mixed up album, and I don't, so I'm not going to. Um, what I'm going to do here is really just say it, Disintegration is a phenomenal album. It's it's one of my favourite albums. Uh, it's an album that I tend to listen to live because I've heard the studio version so much, I listen to the live recordings instead. Uh, and, and that is something that I do with a lot of bands that I love is I listen to the live recordings and live versions by The Cure are often absolutely incredible. The Prayer Tour, which the band played, which ran from, I think, May, early May, until September 1989, only four months. Um, the shows weren't filmed, and I think Robert said that he wished they, they, they had filmed a show on there, uh, and the only recordings, official recordings, were from, I think, Wembley Arena, and only 12 of those songs have been released. I think it was probably the band at, at the apex of their live performance, um, and yeah, there are bootlegs out there of the shows. They are great. If you like Live, live Cure, look beyond the quality and listen to the shows. Um, the next time I talk about The Cure, I am going to be talking about the, the perhaps unloved period, which is the Mixed Up album, a collection of 12-inch remixes, um, which is a nice way of saying, how do you follow up a release like Disintegration? Well, you don't. You just do a remix dance album instead of re-recording, which is going to be the next Cure one. Uh, but coming up, I will be talking about David Bowie, R.E.M., Suede, anything else I can think of. And in the meantime, um, I thought I might not have enough to talk about with this. And as it turns out, I could probably go on for about another four hours, but you'd be really glad if I don't. So I'm going to stop here. Um, stay lovely in the comments. I will post links to live recordings down there, remixes, demos, all that type of stuff. Um, and in the meantime, um, take care of yourselves and each other, as uh, Jerry Springer would have it. I will see you all again sometime soon we'll meet again who knows where who knows when hopefully it'll all be at a show where we're crying down the front uh probably watching a scottish band that make really really loud music anyway see you soon bye